hello everybody. Uh, very welcome to all the early birds that who are today to take part in our early Saturday meeting. And uh, let us start with the first plenary session. And let me introduce to you the first uh, speaker for our plenary session. Here is. Uh, uh, professor uh, Emanuel Ordorica, uh, Professor of Sociology and Education in the National Autonomous University of uh, Mexico. Uh, his research projects are well known and focused uh, on mostly on the quite interesting and provoking and fruitful attempts to uh, ground political science categories and political science approaches uh, onto the ground of university development and transformation. And this uh, really aroused some uh, provoking question on the nature of uh, academic groups' uh, competition within university and uh, knowledge production and uh, good governance practice uh, in university, especially taking into account uh, globalization and transformation of universities. And I really uh, do believe that... Uh, uh, such a sophisticated uh, understanding and approach to the uh, political nature of university also has its roots on personal background of a uh, professor who is uh, one of the was one of the brightest student activists uh, and also founder of political party and political figure and uh, acts at the present time as political figure and public intellectual so uh, we all uh, really uh, look forward to hearing Hearing some provocative uh, report and uh, thought provocative uh, presentation. So the floor is yours. Uh, I think that we have some 40 or 45 minutes for presentation and then some time for questions and comments. So, very welcome. Good morning to all of you, uh, especially for being here on Saturday. Uh, thank you, Sergey, for this very nice presentation. And I, I'd like to thank uh, Isaac and uh, Maria for the invitation to be here. Uh, you know you're in a little bit of trouble when uh, your presentation is portrayed as provocative. And, uh, but do, I do hope to be able to uh, create some interest and stir up uh, a little bit of a, a discussion about universities by looking at them from a so political sociology perspective. Uh, I, I was asked by Isaac to uh, prepare um, a PowerPoint presentation. I don't like it very much because I don't usually uh, do it very well with PowerPoint. There it is. It disappeared. Uh, yeah. So uh, <laughs> he didn't like my comment at all. So, uh, oh. oh, there it is. So... Um, well, this is what my presentation is going to be about. Um, some of you were uh, attended the Tuesday workshop where I talked about universities as political institutions in society. I'm not going to go very far into that, but basically the argument is that there is enough historical evidence uh, to show that from the very inception of universities in the 11th century, uh, these institutions have been plagued with uh, internal conflicts and confrontations over the role of institutions, the alignment of institutions with other institutions of society. And we will see some of these in the next uh, few slides and, and, the se and the latter part of the presentations. Then I try to hook up with the uh, topic of this conference. Are universities really dynamic or not? And what does that mean? Um, I'm going to go through very fast through several paradigms of uh, in which, ways in which the university has been portrayed historically and then focus a little bit more on the 1960s and a period of intense politicization at universities because I think it's relevant for our understanding of universities today. Then I'm going to look at the prevailing mainstream uh, portrait of universities as uh, the, some of the motors of the knowledge economy and so heavily connected to that. And finally, I'm going to close with my arguments about the repoliticization of the university uh, in current times. Um, so 
our university is really dynamic. This has, this has been a matter of huge debate. And uh, it's absolutely contradictory. When we look at our university celebrations and we see people wearing lar long togas and, and strange hats and these very fancy uh, collars and stuff like that and things being said in Latin and universities stay using their coat or arms with Latin logos and, 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 uh, and things like that, you say, wow, are we so proud of our uh, historical pedigree? Uh, this is the way I think of it. We, we like to celebrate our PhDs by dressing up very uh, clownish style. And we all do it, by the way, even if we criticize it. In the end, we're so proud of our, our, our degrees that we, we just fill into the way in which university people have to perform. So that would say uh, we haven't changed much in uh, uh, 10 centuries and that makes us proud too. And we are very fast to say that universities are amongst uh, one of the most stable institutions in society. Ten centuries of universities. That is amazing. Yeah, there's more than ten centuries of bakeries. But you never hear a baker saying, oh, I'm so proud of my heritage as a baker or something like that. Still, uh, universities, we have managed to portray ourselves in such a way that we can uh, talk about our ancient history as something that makes us strong, that makes us important to society, that makes us very, very central to what is going on in the world at every moment. Uh, there has been uh, a lot of discussion about university and change. Philip Albach, for example, made this uh, oversweeping statement uh, around in the 1970s saying that universities were amongst the most conservative institutions in society. And he said, universities are always talking about change, but they seldom change. Now, uh, if we see universities historically, it is very difficult to say that they have not changed over these uh, 10 centuries of existence. And uh, I try to look at uh, continuity and disruption. You see my lack of ability with the PowerPoint, something missing there, continuity and. Uh, um, by just trying to revise uh, a few paradigms that have historically branded universities and, and describe the, uh, their roles and the way they perform. Uh, so we had the university originally, after the students built the first university in Bologna, basically to get a degree in order to perform professionally, and they organized themselves, and they paid for faculty. That didn't last for long. Somebody came out and took the university out of the students' hands, which is usually what they want to do everywhere, all the time, in the 11th century and today when it happens. So uh, the religion, the Catholic Church mainly, and the established monarchies in Europe fought over universities. This happened in Spain, it happened in France. It created so much conflict that there were constant migrations from the University of Paris to England. Uh, Cambridge and Oxford were founded two universities because they fought in one of them and then they went to the other one. So conflict was all over the place, and ba the basic tension was around if the university was going to align itself with the, ca with the Catholic Church or with the monarchy. In Henry VIII era, uh, the big intellectual debates happened outside of universities, and uh, uh, basically um, universities had to align themselves with the monarch and, and be participants in the creation of the uh, Church of England. Uh, uh, so they were against the Pope. So you could see instances of this conflict going on and on through centuries. Um, the legacy of that type of confrontation for many years, for e even centuries, was this constant tension within institutions between uh, scholastic performance, that is, uh, thinking and rethinking about classical and religious texts, versus the emerging scientific thought. You know, people were burned for saying that the, that the earth uh, moved around the sun and not the other way around. And uh, uh, these debates 
took place inside and outside of universities. So this tension, uh, which uh, lasted for much longer in universities, for example, in colonial countries in Africa and Latin America, uh, were uh, constantly a contrast uh, between uh, the development of institutions in different places. Then if we move further down to the 18th century, we have a, one of the first very clear projects, national projects for a university. While uh, the German nation was being built, bringing together different small realms and, uh, and uh, small, uh, they were not even republics, but being brought together to build uh, the Weimar Republic, Humboldt thought about the university in uh, two distinct uh, directions. One was the role in a national identity formation as a key issue in developing a university. That was the main purpose of the university, according to Humboldt. And the second one was to be able to establish connections between scientific thought in the university and um, emerging industrialization. And uh, so this gave birth to one of the most referential models of higher education institutions, a different paradigms. We're already in the third, at least, and we could maybe, if, if we go dig deeper, we could make uh, sub-paradigms of each of these ones. Um, when the German model moves to the United States after the independence of the United States from Britain, uh, there's another new model uh, developing in that part of the world. Uh, it is also uh, bearing attention within it. On one hand, it brings uh, in the idea of liberal education from British uh, higher education. But on the other hand, there is this agricultural orientation that is expressed in the land grant policies by the states or the state. It's very difficult to deal with this in the United States, such a, a federated country with so much independence by each of the states. But basically, universities were entrusted with public funds and public lands in order not only to deal with general and liberal education, but to be able to connect with agricultural production. And in some ways, a part of the Humboldtian model was brought into the American University to establish the first connections with growing enterprises and industrialization. Then comes, of course, in the uh, middle of the 20th century, the golden era of the university. After the Second World War, the big expansion in the U.S. through the GI Bill, which allowed the um, soldiers that were coming back from the war to enroll in colleges and universities, the building of uh, new, uh, new constructions on campuses, new universities all over the place. And it's the big expansion of higher education all over the world. Enrollments go up. And uh, its funding, public funding for institutions goes up very strongly. And it seems to be a very stable moment where universities are uh, at the epitome of this uh, mythology of um, uh, academic freedom, autonomy, self-governance, etc. Now, all of that has to be qualified in some ways because uh, it's also uh, the time, uh, one of the peak times of the Cold War. So academic freedom and autonomy coexist, for example, with the loyalty oath in the United States where faculty, in order to be able to be appointed at such in public institutions, had to sign this loyalty oath and declare that they were not members of the Communist Party. They would never be members of the Communist Party. They would never follow any communist directive, and they would be loyal to the American presidency and the values of the forefathers and all these things that the Americans say all over the place. So just to show you, uh, in a very brief amount of time, I have covered a very long uh, set of historical periods where universities have changed. And the paradigms about universities changed. So uh, I want to focus on the 1960s because nobody planned for this change. There was no Humboldt drawing down what the role of institutions would, uh, would be. Probably the 1960s have been totally underrated. 
We haven't done the necessary work to understand how much the world changed in the 1960s and how much universities and university faculty and university students were involved in changing contemporary society. There was this big cultural uh, change. Talk about family, talk about sex, talk about a lot of, of uh, relationships in society, music, cultural expressions, painting, everything changed in the 1960s. And uh, a lot of that had to do with very strong student movements, to, with the rejection by American faculty of the loyalty oath. This happened first of all in Berkeley, when the where the faculty said, no more, we're not going to sign that loyalty oath no more. And this is about the same time as the free speech movement comes about, 1962 in Berkeley. But uh, basically, just not to go in detail uh, over each of these processes happening at the time, but we had in almost all of the world anti-authoritarian and pro-democracy movements, for example in Mexico, with a huge student movement that ended up with 400 uh, students killed in the Tlatelolco Plaza in 1968, or the student movement in Czechoslovakia uh, uh, with uh, Jan uh, Benes uh, uh, turning fire on himself as a protest over the invasion of Czechoslovakia and university students uh, striking uh, in their struggle for a democratic socialism. Um, then we had, in the, also in the 60s, the struggles for civil rights in the United States, committed students that were doing all these freedom walks and these freedom tours to the southern states of the United States in order to promote uh, uh, voting enrollment and, and vote, voting rights for racial equality and apartheid, anti-apartheid, not only in the U.S., but in South Africa. This is a moment where black consciousness comes as a concept within higher education and uh, feeds into the ANC and other anti-apartheid groups in, in South Africa in these big struggles that started a major shift that ended up maybe 30 years later with the uh, surrender or the falling apart of the apartheid regime. There were a lot of national liberation struggles, starting with Cuba in 1959. The Cuban leadership of the revolution had all been student leaders in the University of Havana in the 1950s. Uh, but then came the struggles against the war in Vietnam and Algeria, mainly in France and the United States, but almost all over the world. Demonstrations against uh, these uh, colonial wars and anti-colonial uprisings were happening in all of Latin America, Africa, and a lot of countries in Southeast Asia, not to mention the United States who, that had a major involvement in the Vietnam War. Uh, stemming from these student movements, a lot of topics that are today on the table that have been discussed for decades now, really uh, gained a lot of thrust uh, in like a second wave of feminism after the right to vote for women had uh, organized uh, a lot of women's struggles. From the universities came feminism and gender equality struggles that have made uh, a lot of advances, uh, especially at university levels, but has projected uh, towards society in general. Environmentalism, the first uh, issues of uh, uh, sustainability and the environment started to come up from the 1960s movements in universities in Europe and uh, the United States mainly. A uh, lot of struggles in uh, African and Latin American universities about social justice and revolution. Uh, governments were put in place, many, in many cases, faculty and students, the universities themselves, were involved in this process. And, of course, this huge cultural change that generated a lot of values that were later, many of them, coalesced and called political correctness. Uh, the way to behave regarding others, regarding difference, regarding otherness, and uh, uh, which are very relevant to note because of the times we are living in right now. So uh, after this politicization process in the 1960s, when the student movements start to go down, the critical role of universities 
this didn't happen, of course, in one moment and exactly at the same time everywhere, but it started to erode, to come down, to diminish, and there was like a period of neutrality where usually in many countries, governments bought social peace with universities, with the urban middle classes through increased uh, budgets and financial uh, allocations for public institutions, the expansion of enrollments, and the creation of new universities. They were trying to bring this critical mass of university people into the political systems. And they did it pretty successfully. Then, by the end of the 1970s, we have the Thatcher and Reagan revolution, and everything in my view, started going downhill from there. Uh, other people like Burton Clark think that it's when things started going upwards and the universities started to get better and become entrepreneurial. Uh, I think that in, even though the entrepreneurial university is not written until later, by the uh, 1990s, this idea that the universities have to be these centers of knowledge development that are heavily, very strongly connected to industrial expansion, uh, to the new digital era, to, um, uh, to the technology transfers, uh, to focus universities on graduate studies and science production, but not only publications, but innovation and uh, technology, technology, technology is the big word. And universities were very, very much geared into that idea a technology transfers office in every university where there are no technology transfers possible or necessary no. or even thinkable because there, there is no technology development in most of the institutions in the world and because there is no market for knowledge developed in uh, universities almost anywhere outside from the United States. Maybe a few countries, maybe Germany a little bit or the UK. But it, basically this is a, a US model that has been portrayed as the successful model everywhere else. So we are uh, set up in an international competition, which later in the early 2000s, in 2003, with the uh, Shanghai ranking, is uh, uh, this competition is measured by the, this apparently very objective uh, type of uh, uh, classification of institutions, very hierarchical, very much focused essentially on the international circulation of knowledge through publications in index journals. And uh, based on that, uh, general idea that they could uh, establish some qualification of the quality of institutions all over the world and their ability to compete with each other for the best students, for uh, resources at the international level and for the best faculty too. But uh, this paradigm, as many of the other paradigms, are based in a lot of myth, mythical ideas. And of course, there's part of reality. There's been uh, the, the reality of, uh, of this entrepreneurial university is the amazing growth of, let me use this very bad word, shitty publications in scientific journals, no? Because uh, nobody says that we have much better publications. We have much, many more publications, but it's almost impossible to say that knowledge that has been produced in this last 20 to 25 years is really a quantum leap in our ability to understand nature, to understand society, to understand about anything, no? So let us look a little bit at one of the ways in which we can measure the mythical part of the university in the knowledge economy. This is about university patents. And university patents is, as I was telling you, basically a US endeavor. It doesn't happen much anywhere else, maybe some Asian universities. Just look at this data. You know? uh, Look at the growth of university patents versus the growth of patents overall granted in the United States from, uh, in, in these 20 years. Uh, this is, uh, if you look at the growth of university patents from 1969 to 2012, it's about the same. So there is no quantum leap in this, uh, this, uh, in this transfer of knowledge. These are only granted patents. 
No, there is not enough information to look at licensed patents. Licensed patents are the ones that produce money. The other one you can store or you can get a, a diploma in your faculty office saying, uh, René has got a patent and, uh, and he's very important. I'm sure in some areas it's really important. If I were to get a patent, I don't know of what, uh, but uh, probably my CV would be enriched and I would be uh, more favorably uh, assessed or evaluated as a faculty member. But who knows if my institution didn't lose money, because most institutions lose money when they go through the patenting process. Now look at the second part of the data. Uh, the participation in the whole amount of patents, in the total amount of granted patents, didn't grow. It's almost negligible. No? So are these, are universities the driving force of the information economy and the knowledge economy? This data doesn't seem to support that myth. Then look at this other one. At least 620 US research universities received, received federal funding for research. Uh, this is in 2014. I'm sorry that I didn't put the, the, the um, number there. Only uh, 100 of these 620 have five patents or more per year. So uh, you move from the University of California that has like 400 patents a year, and the next one is 200 and then it goes to 100, it moves downwards very rapidly. So 25 US universities concentrate 50% of university granted patents uh, since 1969. So does that account for uh, a solid view of the entrepreneurial institution that is transferring knowledge at a fast pace and having a very strong impact upon the knowledge economy and the information age? I don't think so. But university presidents and university boards and even us faculty and students, we have bought into the project. And we, are th we think that we are extremely re relevant to the knowledge society. And of course, there's, there has historically been professional formation. That has Probably our graduates are much better than they were before. I don't put that in doubt. But is that necessarily uh, an outcome of the university being geared towards the knowledge society? Is the increase in master's and doctoral degrees uh, driven by the knowledge economy or by the fact that uh, undergraduate enrollments are becoming almost universal in some countries? Is it only demographics? Nobody's done a lot of studies about this because challenging the myth that we are very important because we are part of the international competition that is driving the world ahead in this intense econ uh, knowledge economy struggle and path towards the future. It's an interesting myth and universities are really good with myths and uh, we can embody them in very nice ways. Now let's see what is uh, happening to us now. While we were thinking about knowledge transfers and competition and our important role in society, a lot of things starting to happen in the world. I'm gonna go to the second slide and come back to this one. We never thought this could happen. We got together with our colleagues from the US, from US universities and everybody told you, oh, there is no way that Trump is gonna be the Republican candidate. That is never gonna happen. Once that happened, then they told you, no, no. And we believed it because we thought it the same way. Uh, there's no way he's gonna be the president. Nobody would vote in their sound judgment would vote for him because you know he's racist, he has done sexual harassment. Everybody knows that. He's proud of it. How women are not going to vote for him. Poor people can't vote for somebody that's going to strip them away from, uh, from health care. That's not going to happen. And it happened. And the, one of the things that it showed is that as universities all over the world, we are so strongly disconnected with what is going on around us. 
We don't even understand our own environment. The same thing happened in the UK. So I'll get back to the, to the Trump thing, uh, the Trump phenomenon. But uh, I want to just show you things that are happening in the world, have been happening for the last five years, and maybe we haven't taken notice about it. Lots of struggles for access, free higher education, and against for, pro for profit higher education. In the UK, they even burnt the Conservative Party's uh, uh, building in, in London. No? Uh, Germany obtained in two, 2015 the free tu tuition, free higher education. Occupy Wall Street students were complaining about the costs of uh, student debts. Um, Chile uh, student movements put 100,000 people on the streets and they gained tuition free higher education. It's uh, to, uh, being debated in Congress. Colombia, exactly the same, and Puerto Rico. So we have very, very big student movements all over the world about access to higher education institutions. No wonder. If we're telling everybody that universities are the driving force, everybody wants to be part of that. Now, there are not enough public universities, and uh, uh, the demand is much larger than the, than the possibilities for access. Then we have very political processes. Brazilian federal universities were banned by the government to discuss the congressional coup d'etat against the legal president Dilma Rousseff. And the rectors had to go to the Supreme Court in Brazil to guarantee the right for university members, faculty and students to debate the political situation in Brazil at the time. And they won. Of course, the process was lost because Congress got rid of Dilma Rousseff and all these corrupt Brazilian politicians are in power right now. But the universities played a major role. The students mobilized and the rectors did a joint action towards the Supreme Court. Colombian universities, when the vote for peace happened in the referendum, it was called Universities for Peace. All of the universities in the country coalesced calling the population to vote in favor of peace in the referendum, and the referendum was lost. Later, it was in some ways reversed. Uh, faculty and students on universities called against the vote for Brexit in the UK. Not very successful either, but it's very clear that uh, educated people voted against Brexit. Uh, the indignado students in Spain have developed two political parties that have totally changed the political scenario in Spain. One a right-wing party and uh, another a left-wing Podemos and the right-wing Ciudadanos. Now, rectors in Venezuela reject both the government and the opposition in their confrontation in the last six or seven months. And students struggle in South Africa. They are bringing down the statues of, of uh, Rhodes, this very racist, uh, apparently uh, very gracious uh, philanthropist of higher education in South Africa. So let's get back to the U.S. I'm almost going to be over. Trump symbol symbolizes everything that challenges higher education. We are in front of that. We are isolated. Our political and academic values have been challenged. Not only all this political correctness stemming from universities as a way to interact with each other have been put into question by the ways in which the president behaved even before he was voted. So this uh, gender uh, neutral or uh, uh, race inclusive discourse and, and, and performance was has been thrown out and people voted for that. And that's a vote against universities. But even more so, Trump is a champion of alternative facts. So alternative facts is whatever he wants to make at every moment, starting with the environment. Oh, there's no global warming. It's these university wackos that are deciding that the, the earth is warming up. Who, there's no evidence about that. I have alternative facts. So we can drill in Alaska, we can bring down trees, we can do everything. Nothing is happening at, to the environment. Now the universities have started to react after decades of passivity, 
by university administrations and faculty, universities are trying, uh, starting to criticize. The, there's a very nice uh, uh, piece, written piece by the president of Bard College, Leonard Botstein, uh, saying American universities must take a stand. And this hasn't happened for a long time in the US and in many other countries either. So the nature of universities themselves and the idea of pursuit of knowledge is put into question by the very existence of a discourse of alternative facts. And the colleges and universities, a lot of them very prestigious, have criticized immigration bans and the, the bringing down of the Dreamers Act that is throwing a lot of Mexican young people away from the US and who were enrolled in higher education or, or educational projects. So I just want to finish by saying there has, there, we are living in a changing moment. The discourse is starting to focus more on the increasing crisis of political systems, political parties, representations, uh, people representation, and political discourse all over the world. And universities are starting to play a major role on those topics again. I'm not saying that a shift of paradigm implies that suddenly universities are going to stop publishing, they're going to close their technology transfer office and abandon the idea that we are the drivers of the knowledge economy. But at least we have to bring into the forefront the notion that political institutions in society are in crisis and that universities as another political institution in society in which critical thinking and moral authority is based on knowledge are played, are called to play a major role in the political construction of our contemporary world. So I think that yes, there's a need to be dynamic, but the dynamics are not necessarily the dynamics of the economic world, which has driven us for three decades now. And probably it's very useful, at least, not to replace the economic cost-benefit analysis that has been the mainstream driving force for university policy in the last decades, but incorporate a political understanding of where is it that our universities are being located and what are the political and societal challenges that are being brought upon our institutions? Not only in order to survive, to be able to adapt and to continue existing for another centuries with our caps and gowns, but in order to be able to have an impact in political change and societal, societal change in the near future. Thank you very much. Uh, perfect, you're quite in time, just less than 45 minutes, so we have plenty of time for questions and comments. You're welcome to ask uh, in Russian or in English, we have simultaneous translation, so please, someone, no, I can see. Uh, everything is so clear or so provoking, you have a question. Oh, okay. Thank you for an interesting presentation, perhaps the best presentation at this conference, in my view, because research projects, from research projects about the past and the present, you went over to discussing the future of universities. In your presentation, why can identify several generations of universities. It's a fashion to use these phrases, University 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, 1.0 .0 was a scholastic university, and that's the year of the birth of universities. 2.0 is a research university, Humboldtian model 3.0, and thank you for the distinction and debunking this myth of entrepreneurial university, which is uh, being implemented very narrowly uh, locally. What would be a 4.0 university, a political university or some other university? 
and what would be the major set of problems that they will be dealing with as a driver of uh, uh, development processes, not just reproducing old knowledge, old thinking formats, but as a driver of social development. So what will be a, a 4.0 university be about? Thank you. Uh, I was uh, always very bad at keeping track with software based on the uh, 1.0 and 1.1 and all this stuff. Uh, but uh, I, I agree with you that we have had these overlapping paradigmatic changes. And uh, it's very difficult to have a crystal ball to show what universities are going to look like in the future. But uh, I do think that the pendulum that, ha that moved towards uh, basic sciences and engineering and uh, technology, uh, high technology content research and teaching is probably going to move slightly back to the humanities and the social sciences. Uh, there's going to be a need for a wider type of economic thought, uh, not only uh, uh, modeling economics and econometrics and stuff like that, but more history of economics, it's my view. There's, uh, there's going to be uh, a need. I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm, I'm trying to focus on what's going to be needed, uh, what is already needed, more historical perspectives about society and education in general, and much more uh, uh, sociology or sociological, uh, not to narrow it to a discipline, but more to a field of studies, sociological understandings of society. Basically, I think that we have to be able to reverse uh, one of the major shifts that happened in the late 1970s, which was uh, called by Sheldon Walling the economization of public philosophy, when everything that we thought was public interaction in the social, cultural, and political realm suddenly was narrowed down into cost-benefit and economic analysis. We have to be able to enrich our own lives through knowledge in terms of being able to think about what really goes on in our everyday life and it's not, it's not necessarily a rational economic set of decisions that are being made by individuals or institutions. And if you look at the last Nobel Prize in economics, some of that work is making headway when you bring social beha uh, be, uh, behavioral uh, theories into what used to be considered one of the basic foundations of new economics, the rationality of economic decision making has been put into question very strongly. I think we're moving in the direction of a broadening, broadening the scope of knowledge and understanding that goes way beyond uh, economics and technology and innovation in the uh, economic spheres and industrial spheres. So I think that we have to recover the universal nature of universities in terms of being able to address different types of knowledge and human activities. Thank you. Uh, the history. I want to go back to the 1960s. Um, and, and the, the, the politicization that happened in universities at that point. One of the, one of the, um, the, uh, the effects of, of, of the revolts of the 1960s was also changes in the internal governance and organization of universities. Um, and one of the dramatic changes that took place in, in the aftermath of the, the, the 1960s was um, that in many countries students were allowed into governing bodies. Uh, they were suddenly part of decision-making. You, you saw junior faculty also being allowed into the, 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 the decision-making bodies, even, even administrators. And you also uh, saw in many countries a lot of people from, from outside the university coming into the university. Um, and I'm curious how, do you, how you interpret that kind of change in the governance of university, especially when you compare it to what you call the, the second, maybe the emergence of the second uh, politicization phase of, of the university now. Do we see that because these governance structures that, 
that, uh, that um, developed in the aftermath of the 1960s, that they didn't really uh, bring the, 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 they didn't deliver on, on the promise? Or how do you assess these structures that, uh, that popped up after the 1960s? Um, I would say that in... Thanks. Um, in many countries, uh, shared governance existed way before the 1960s. In the U.S., for example, uh, there was student participation. It was small, but uh, it existed. In Latin America, it was co-governance since 1918 in Argentina, and it spread all over the continent. And... Uh, uh, I think it brought many problems to the floor of uh, university governments, but it also brought uh, the possibility of building legitimate consensual decision into uh, the running of everyday life in institutions. I'm not sure, I haven't done enough studies to argue that, uh, they, that co shared governance didn't deliver on the promise. Uh, what I think is that we suddenly were challenged with the efficiency discourse. And shared governance is less efficient than having managerial governance of institutions. Uh, but I have an argument that is very important. Uh, I think we all share some ideas of what universities should look like. And autonomy is a highly, value, highly valued notion about higher education in uh, universities and colleges. Uh, in my view, the possibilities of exercising real autonomy depend on two basic issues. One is the ability to build internal coalitions within universities vis-a-vis -vis external bodies in the government or the broader state. The second one is the ability to connect with uh, social constituencies in the universities. We are doing badly in both directions. Uh, Sheila Slaughter argued in 1983, if I'm not mistaken, that universities were in danger because they were very expensive and the people didn't feel that universities were looking at them and thinking about their problems. And I think that the vote in the United States, in some ways, the voters for Trump place universities as part of the status quo and the, and the government, the big, big government, what they call big government. Uh, but on the internal side, I think that collegial uh, running of universities has been substituted for ex managerial expertise and that certainly hasn't delivered in order to allow universities to remain as collegial uh, institutions in which it, uh, their life is being driven by knowledge exchange and knowledge creation. So probably what we need to think about is a good middle point between the use of expertise in the management, administrative part of the university, but... Uh, rebuilding the collegial and politicized uh, expressions of uh, co-governance in order to maintain uh, adequate uh, equilibrium within our institutions. Um, yes, hi. Uh, Mark Johnson, UW-Madison. I have two things. Yes, thank you for a really extraordinary presentation. And I'm... Um, I agree with you about the, the global transformations of the late 1960s, especially 1968, quite literally in Mexico City, Indonesia, China, you know, and, and Prague. And there's two parts of that that are really compelling, and, and I'd like to end with a question to the group. Um, there's a very powerful historical account by Jeremy Surrey. I believe it's Power and Dissent, and he makes the, the kind of larger argument that the, the superpowers recognized in the face of this radical mobilization that they had to wind down the Cold War and begin the process of demilitarization at the level of geopolitics. So detente began, the US reached out to communist China, uh, the Vietnam War began winding down. And then in exchange for that, domestically, 
in the United States, certainly there were concessions made around student role in governance and the quality of student services and dormitories, but there was also very selective repression against the most radical students. So the most radical elements in the anti-war movement and the, and the racial justice movements were often expelled from the universities. We saw brutal repression in Mexico and Indonesia and elsewhere. Um, and ultimately, of course, in China as well, when the students involved in the Cultural Revolution were put down by the Chinese army in the end of the 1960s. So it, the, you know, the geopolitics of that moment, and, and Surrey's book is complicated because it's a very positive story that we stepped back from the brink of nuclear confrontation, but in exchange for this very complicated kind of rebalancing of the domestic political equilibrium. And of course, in Latin America, there was a whole series of military coups in the years that followed in reaction to that as well. And then I'm uh, intrigued, very intrigued, and I'd like to open this question up to the, to the audience as a whole, because one of the anomalies in the late 1960s was the relative quiescence of Soviet students in the Soviet Union. And now there were exceptions to that. There were incidents at Saratov State that were hushed up and kind of, and there were elements of Soviet movements. They were certainly very active in the Prague Spring. But I'm kind of curious about you know, the history of the Studienstva and the politics of that in the 1960s and 1970s. And in a sense, perhaps it was simply a delayed reaction where we saw a very prominent role for young people and students and university leaders in the independence movements of the late 1980s. Um, and you saw that in Georgia and you saw that in Kyrgyzstan where sort of academics emerged as the leaders of the independent republics after the end of the Soviet Union with Oskar Akayev and others. Um, but I'm kind of curious about that, you know, the, the analogs to this global phenomena in the Soviet system. I'm, I, I have no clue. <laughs> uh, I think it's a fascinating topic and uh, probably you, you could uh, have much more information or our colleagues here uh, who understand the Soviet transition and the pre-transition uh, period better. Uh, you have comment to this question, or you have another question? <laughs> okay. Okay. Let let move to another question. Yes. Yes. Dobry. Uh, good morning. My name is Vasily from Omsk. Thank you for your presentation. Because you appeal the universities to be within the political and social life. But please tell us, what mechanisms do you see available for universities for this kind of for this disruption? These are new mechanisms or do or this a mechanism already existing? Uh, the universities can be also prepared, the elites, the revolutionary movements or any experts, councils. Thank you. Thank you, Vasily, for your question. Uh, I think that uh, uh, there's not a unique recipe for this. Uh, it depends a lot on the political context in each of our countries. But I think that first we need to uh, recover the notion of faculty as public intellectuals, uh, especially faculty in the social sciences. Not in many countries, faculty write in newspapers and uh, have uh, editorial pieces or op-ed pieces commenting on political or other type or social events that are happening. Uh, but also, uh, seeing what is happening in the U.S., you see another level of university uh, involvement, which is when rectors coalesce and uh, sign up uh, declarations like uh, this set of this very long list of uh, of uh, U.S. universities signing against the immigration bans, or when you have the Chilean rectors, the Council of Chilean University Rectors, all of the u universities in Chile supporting the students in their struggle against tuition. Uh, so then you have the administrative level of the university committed with some political processes. Then you have the students are the most dynamic force in the institutions all the time. So um, a repolitization of uh, university life would necessarily pass for uh, opening, reopening the spaces for student organization and student debates and student commitment 
to what is happening outside. We have been driving our students away from society and telling them that they have to look at very narrow topics in order to finish their dissertation, not to be excessively ambitious, not to be creative enough. You have to be able to compete for a position out there. So uh, we as faculty have to be a driving force in helping students to uh, grasp their role as uh, one of the most significant transformers of contemporary societies. And these are only some of the ways, but also uh, the research projects that we tackle, uh, that we incorporate into our uh, programs in our institutions. We have uh, done away with a lot of stuff, and, but we have also met, made headway. There are gender studies programs in many universities. Should we adopt new ones? Should we make them broader? Should we be more political in these projects in rejecting the, uh, let's say, like the, the male domination uh, backlash that is happening in many countries in the world? So I think that there's a, a wide variety of actions that can be taken in different levels of commitment, even individual commitment. Uh, it can happen from the classroom upwards. Thank you. Okay, we are near to finish our uh, session. Uh, very thank you for your presentation and for your question and discussion. But we need to go forward to uh, Chris Murphy report and uh, just to keep on our good pace. Uh, thank you so much and uh, let's finish the, this part of session. Thank you. Thank you, Sergey. Thank you very much. <laughs>